How dare you ask a man to go out and risk his life? And when he returns, calmly request him to hand in his uniform and in exchange, hand him a pittance that will reduce a once self-respecting citizen to a miserable pauper, dependent on either charity or friends. Helen Armstrong is worried about the bleak future facing returning soldiers in the working class after the war. Fred Dixon is angry about the past. Those responsible for the Ross rifle, defective shells, shoddy clothes, paper boots, and the whole black record of profiteering gave 10,000 times more aid and comfort to the enemy than all the socialists and conscientious objectors put together. People were expecting a better world after the misery of war. Instead, many people cannot find jobs. Inflation is rampant. Round steak is up from 10 cents to 39 cents a pound, and coffee has doubled in price. Tensions are mounting all over Canada. It is in Winnipeg that they will explode. The city's building and metal workers demand the right to bargain through more powerful centralized unions. Winnipeg's employers refuse. Fred Gordienko, a Ukrainian blacksmith, works in a CNR shop. I meet a union leader in the street. He tells me, Fred, we can't avert a strike. We have to go because they don't want absolutely to take consideration of what we want. He told me, we don't like strike, but we forced to do it because the other way? How do you defend your rights? Blacksmith, Slogal 61. 12146 against. When their demands aren't met, the building and metal workers walk off the job on May 1st, 1919. It is an ordinary strike, but it sparks an extraordinary response. It has only been 18 months since the Tsar of Russia was overthrown, following a general strike in Petrograd. Talk of revolution is sweeping the world, and militants promote the idea of the general strike, the shutting down of entire cities as the only way of achieving their goal here at home. On May 15th, a general strike is called in Winnipeg. The first to walk out are the Hello Girls, Winnipeg's telephone operators. Within two hours, the city is almost completely paralyzed. 30,000 union and non-union workers leave their jobs. Sympathy strikes break out all across the country. Ottawa fears a Bolshevik revolution. It is up to Arthur Meehan, acting Minister of Justice, to stifle the strike before Canadians panic. The leaders of the general strike are all revolutionists of varying degrees and types, from crazy idealists to ordinary thieves. J.S. Woodsworth returns to his hometown from Vancouver to see if he can help his old friends. Soon he is working with Fred Dixon at the Western Labour News, printing a daily strike bulletin. This strike is not engineered from Russia. In reality, the strike has nothing to do with revolution. It is an attempt to meet a very pressing and immediate need. The organized workers, like everyone else, are faced with the high cost of living. Like most people, they imagine it. If they can get higher wages, they can buy more food. Winnipeg's employers fight back. The Citizens Committee of 1000, led by A.J. Andrews, unites them against the workers. The only way to deal with Bolshevism is to hit it and to hit it hard every time it lifts its ugly head. Ottawa takes direct aim at the strike leaders, making it easier to deport immigrants without trial. They say one of our strike leaders is a German. I don't care what a man is if he's whole under the skin and a worker. 
The only enemy alien we have in Canada is the capitalist and the strike breaker. As head of the Women's Labor League, Helen Armstrong organizes the women workers and workers' wives. She spends three days in jail on a charge of inciting to disorder. Peace is all right for the folk who ride in automobiles and the thugs in red coats who do their bidding. There will be no peace for the worker until we get a living wage and proper living conditions. For six weeks, the strike committee virtually runs Winnipeg. The city fires all but 16 policemen, and anti-strike specials are sworn in to replace them. The Royal Northwest Mounted Police, the Redcoats, are also brought in. On June 10th, a crowd gathers to hear a speech. The special police try to disperse them. A riot breaks out, in which one police officer is injured. The strikers seem to be winning. Business leaders are panicked and demand harsh measures. The federal authorities step in and arrest the strike leaders. Helen Armstrong's husband, George, is one of 10 strike leaders arrested and spirited away to Stony Mountain Penitentiary. To protest this extraordinary action, veterans who support the strike organize a silent parade on June 21st in defiance of a ban by Winnipeg's mayor, Charles Gray. A large crowd of 6,000 gathers in front of City Hall. A streetcar operated by strike breakers approaches on its route. The veterans overturn it and set it on fire. The mounted police charge. People were excited. I was in the corner where the shooting started. I see the mounted police turn the corner and one of the horses fall down. And after that, Two or three mounted police get mixed up with that. Someone falls, someone jumps. One man, standing on the sidewalk, thought the Mounties were firing blank cartridges until a spectator standing beside him dropped with a bullet through his breast. Another standing nearby was shot through the head. Lines of special police swinging their big clubs were thrown across Main Street and the intersecting thoroughfares. Dismounted redcoats lined up, declaring military control. Two people are killed. 94 are arrested. Like the conscription riots of Quebec City, once again a popular demonstration is brutally repressed. Forty days after it began, the largest social revolt in Canadian history has been crushed. Whoever ordered the shooting last Saturday is a Kaiser of the deepest dye. Following Bloody Saturday, Fred Dixon publishes an article that leads to charges of seditious conspiracy. At his trial, he pleads to the jury to defend free speech. Liberty of opinion, that is what is on trial. I advised men to use their ballots and keep the peace. You are the last hope so far as the liberty of the subject is concerned. In your hands is placed the question of liberty of speech, whether a man has a right to criticize government officials or not. Dixon is acquitted. Many others are jailed or deported. Fred Gordienko is asked to leave his blacksmith's job. 
they start to lay off after the strike. The Russian, the immigrants, start to lay them off, and then they come to lay me off too. The union try to fight. They say, if you want, we will fight for you. I said, this job in the shop. The smoke, the dirt, is not worth to put all the union to fight. And so we went, about five of us. In the years to come, there will be other defining clashes between labor and capital. Glace Bay, Nova Scotia, is virtually occupied by the army during a bitter strike in 1925. And beyond the factories and smelters, a new movement is arising, one that will reshape the political face of Canada.